Thank you. Thank you for having me here. This is my first sunny day in Toronto, so uh, I'm very pleased to see the city with the sunshine. <laughs> I guess in the area I'm trying to do tables being there, so Anyway, so um, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about some uh, work with simulations, particularly focused to um, understanding the role of black holes in cosmic structure formation. So I'll describe this by sort of motivating very broadly um, what we're trying to do. Um, we know that black holes are, are in galaxies, and but their formation, the way they assemble, the way they grow, and particularly the impact that they have to their surrounding structures, galaxies, and even larger structures is something that remains one of the biggest problems in uh, cosmic structure formation. So we're trying to um, attempt to, to get this piece together. Why would you like to learn uh, about black holes in cosmic structure formation? Because we think they do play um, quite a big role in, in a diverse sort of number of issues. Like um, probably black holes are um, present very early on in the universe with maybe the remnant of population three stars. And uh, so they tell us something about how the universe emerges from the dark ages. Um, we think that if uh, galaxies do indeed have black holes, when, um, when they emerge and when these black holes uh, are fed at very high rates, for instance, during a merger, they can actually impact very strongly um, the colors of galaxies. So galaxy colors is probably something related to the presence of black holes and their associated feedback. And talking of feedback, that we sort of encompass on this topic of feedback for which AGM black holes are part of, which is one of the biggest problems in galaxy formation, understanding stellar and AGM feedback and how that shapes all sorts of properties of galaxies and um, they're certainly part of. Uh, feedbacks that sort of impact on you know, the way feedback operates in galaxies as an impact in the way we also use observation then to also um, use these galaxies as probes for dark energy dark matter. It turns out that varying physics and in particular feedbacks have a large impact in the way we interpret observations as well. So, and you know, power spectrum uh, measure at different scales as inferred from observation actually needs to take into account uh, feedback and varying processes in order to be uh, derived the right constraints. And in general, uh, black holes, of course, are fed by gas. They, so they, they tell us, they give us some more clues about actually gas gets into galaxies, how gas is recycled, and this feedback kind of way. So there's certainly been a lot of progress, and these are just a few snapshots of things that uh, they're not even so well updated, perhaps. On, um, on the observational side, I'm going to talk, tell you a little bit more about the theoretical side, but we know um, things like the signal relationship and the relationship between black hole masses and uh, velocity dispersion in galaxies. There's lots of debate to exactly what kind of galaxies this applies best to, but certainly to um, large ellipticals and large barges. And uh, uh, we know there are black holes and with, in the very, very early universe, uh, the highest redshift uh, quasars now being detected at all the redshift seven. Sloan detected a bunch of redshift six. Uh, so we know that already uh, black holes are forming and are present and they're pretty massive in the very early universe. We have uh, the direct evidence of what they do to the interstellar medium. These are images of the Perseus cluster. This one is the Perseus cluster. And where we see um, how um, AGN uh, jets uh, actually sort of punch through the gas and have a direct effect on the way the gas is moved around in galaxy clusters. We know black holes merge. This is an X-ray observation of uh, emerging galaxies, which shows two point sources. And we have more uh, direct evidence of uh, double nuclei in a number of galaxies, also from slow and so on. So there's definitely a lot of work that um, has pointed to the importance of black holes in many contexts. Uh, what's been lagging behind is our understanding. So our theories have been lagging behind to try and explain all of those observations and others. Um, that, um, that I've shown you. And that's because, of course, when we're trying to do structure formation, um, which is a, a paradigm that has been well established in, within our context of hierarchical structure formation, which is very well established, we can sort of understand how um, 
uh, things occur, you know, how, how gravity operates, of course, and how we can cast that into numerical models at large scales, make a positive kind of scales, understand the things about dark matter um, pretty well these days, but as we move in into, into smaller and smaller scales, which we need to do, of course, if we want to sort of fold in um, some kind of understanding for the formation and the growth of black holes, if we move into the and the size of galaxies, a, a, a number of new problems arise because um, there's a lot more physics that we need to take into account, baryonic physics and feedback. And as we move even closer to um, scales that are relevant for what happens around black holes, we have no hope of getting there what, if we want to do that all of initial simultaneously. So ideally, we like to have the simulations, which does you know, the very large scale structure here, as well as the forming galaxies and the has information about the structure and the gas within these galaxies and how eventually it gets into the black hole. And that's simply impossible to do and extremely challenging. Of course, that doesn't stop us from trying something. And I just um, wanted to show this example. This is a large scale simulation. Um, this is center on a, a cluster. This is from <coughs> the team of Romain Tessier and others. Um, and uh, this shows on one side um, this the, basically the gas on the large scale structure all around the cluster and it's color coded by temperature and it showed you sort of in a case of having no black hole in the center and the case of having a black hole at the center of this cluster how the heating around this cluster is a much more dramatic in the case of um, an AGM. And this is just an illustration. These are the kind of things just very quickly illustrate the kind of things that I'm going to be talking to you about. This is an example from another team, but these are the kind of things that we are starting to probe and starting to, to do. So large scale structure, but also has some kind of models which will tell us about the influence of the black hole that sits in the center of galaxies. Okay, so I'll get more into that. This is uh, this, uh, an illustration. Before I get more into that, let me step back a little bit and say, um, okay, so I told you that observations tell us uh, that there are black holes everywhere and that maybe we need to understand what they do, um, but uh, where do we think they come from originally? Okay, so this is not directly something that uh, I worked on, so just, but just to sort of set the stage for where other things um, uh, come from. So one of the first questions, if these black holes are in the galaxies, where do they come from? Uh, where they present, when do they form? Uh, where there are small seeds in galaxies early on, which then grew uh, so that we can, they can account for the black hole populations that we see today, the early craters, and so on. And if they do grow out of some seed population, how, how do they grow? And that's what we're sort of hoping to understand from our structure formation models. So uh, there are two fundamental ideas of what the seeds could be. And uh, uh, the major one is just based on uh, the fact that uh, some sea black holes could be the remnants of the very first um, stars, which are likely to be uh, massive. Um, these objects would form roughly um, around roughly 20 when the first, well, we get the, the this population of roughly 10 to the 6 solar masses halos, in which, which can start cooling by H2. At that point, they can collapse, the gas can collapse and form the first stars. and uh, when um, people do this kind of calculations, which is obviously not what I'm doing here, uh, what um, what uh, they show also from the stellar synthesis models that is, um, the initial masses are likely to be on the order of 100 solar masses or around that, and if indeed they are, then they will leave a remnant object, a remnant which is, um, contains pretty much all the mass of the initial star. So we can end up with black holes of roughly this mass, the C mass, at this early stage is subsequent to the first epoch of star formation. So pop three stellar remnants are one possibility. The other possibility is uh, that instead there are some conditions, um, uh, perhaps more contrived but still very interesting, in which um, actually gas uh, cools, um, uh, actually doesn't cool very effectively and all the gas is actually uh, falling into uh, the very center of the galaxy so that the black hole is formed directly without going through the stages of the first star formation. This assumes that indeed the gas is not um, um, 
that there, ha there have to be some conditions about the cooling of this gas, but you can make scenarios where this is uh, possible, and people have studied that quite extensively in, in different ways, um, concluding that indeed this could be um, a viable method, sort of, um, in this case, the masses that you end up for the black hole seeds are rather larger, um, from 1,000 to uh, 10,000 or solar masses or so. So direct collapse of gas into a central object, still of roughly the same redshift, redshift 20 to 30, or um, seeds that are the remnants of the first population of three stars. So that's sort of where this starts. Yeah. Can you explain these two figures? I've never seen this tree things before. And I don't see Sorry? This. Can you explain these two figures? I don't, I don't know oh, what they are. This is just an illustration. It's just a, a <laughs> it's a structure formation on a schematic way. So this is not a simulation. I was just uh, illustrating um, you know, uh, very schematically uh, places where halos form and within these where the first stars form and, and then uh, the black dot corresponds to the formation of the black hole subsequent to you know, uh, following the first star formation. The same thing here, we have halos um, in this large scale structure, the most massive of which can have a significant amount of gas and for which the, uh, the, the, the can have enough gas, which is the blue stuff that can collapse directly into a black hole. It's just a very, very schematic thing. It's, you should, you should, if it's not clear, don't even worry about it. Uh, so the point is here, really, that's what I was going to try and say, is that uh, uh, what we think the likely seeds could be, and this is purely theoretical, we have no observations of this, is that they could either be objects of the roughly 100 solar masses forming a uh, range of 20 to 30, or more massive, probably 1,000 to 10,000, if um, the gas has collapsed directly. So that's sort of the whole, you know, the only point that I'm trying to make uh, now. And either way, um, the first seeds should appear first in biased photo galaxies because you want to have the first galaxies, the first stars, or lots of gas collapsing. And so this is sort of what constitutes our very, you know, basic uh, initial conditions for understanding the laws of black holes, which is what I'm going to tell you in more detail um, in the way we attempt to do it. At least. So suppose the universe is seeded by objects like that. Um, how do we end up with a black hole population of you know, millions and billions of solar masses black holes that we see today? And in particular, I'll focus also with the first population of massive black holes at high redshift. Okay, so this is sort of an uh, initial condition for a large scale structure formation model. And then I want to talk more about how, given these seeds, how do we grow them and, how, and what do they do as they grow? So a black hole will uh, grow mostly by gas accretion, of course, black holes will merge with each other as their host galaxies merge, but that, of course, will only double their mass, so it's not going to be a very effective way of growing it, whereas by gas accretion, we can exponentiate the mass if they're accreting at a critical rate, and therefore, we expect much more growth um, of these black holes if they are actually spawning gas when they're spawning. So if you're swallowing gas in a black hole, of course, you're radiating a lot of energy at a certain efficiency. And this energy has some effect. So you create you know, a luminous quasar, if the black hole is accreting. And of course, uh, that activity, that energy that is being produced around the black hole is likely to have some effect on the surrounding gas itself, which uh, is what is the basic idea of why the black hole should also provide some form of feedback. So it swallows gas, it therefore produces a lot of energy, and this energy has to go somewhere and do something to the surrounding gas itself. So this is uh, a hard work physics, but in, you know, it's basically what comes in. So given that basic stuff, and of course, uh, that we can study in more detail, but um, one of the problems that uh, comes to uh, focus immediately is uh, the problem of the first phase. So if we're trying to understand the growth of black holes, um, one of the fundamental challenges um, besides producing you know, the black hole mass function today and so on is the very first step is producing the earliest massive black hole. It turns out that Sloan um, and uh, now other data as well um, support, you know, sh have shown that there are quasars, very bright uh, quasars, uh, when the universe was already redshift six, uh, was well, only at redshift six, so less than a billion years old. 
So the question is, how did we form black holes that are as massive as the ones that are in galaxies today when the universe was a tenth of its color A, basically? And uh, so this is, these quasars are very rare, so they're not that every galaxy that actually exists as a bright small quasar or a massive black hole. They're rare, but they still pose an interesting question, which I, I'll focus a little bit on today. So how can we grow black holes so fast is one part of the, the problem, and then how do we grow the rest of the population of black hole? Uh, but um, is, or is it just a bit, you know, this gas accretion? Is there enough gas that can provide significant accretion to do this? So in fact, when you look at the maximum rate of black hole grows at, which is the Eddington rate, uh, roughly at least, then its mass should grow exponentially with time. And you can derive what is this uh, floating time, which is the Eddington time scale. And you can work out, given the time between you know, the seeding, whatever, and Ratchet 6, how much time you've had and how many folding times you've had in order to grow a seed black hole mass of the order of 100 to 10,000 or so solar masses to a mass of 10 to the 9 and bigger solar masses, which is what we roughly infer from the solar equator. And this kind of arguments do tell you that you need basically the black hole to be accreted pretty much in a critical way since the moment that it, uh, it was formed in this table. And um, this is perhaps. Uh, not crazy, but it is something hard to, to imagine, or it, it's not as a trivial thing to do, because of course these initial galaxies, these early galaxies, are pretty shallow potentials, which may not have so much gas, or, you know, or if they do, what, what kind of objects are these? And this is one of the questions that you know, a number of people have um, thought about, and um, we like to, to try and investigate a bit more. How do we get objects that can have significant gas supplies to be growing so fast and provide a way for understanding the formation of these very first objects? Or alternatively, is there some really funky physics about these objects that has nothing to do with the standard way we understand the black hole growth? So I'm going to try and tell you what we can attempt to learn from simulations. And I'm going to try to show you some uh, dumb approach to it, meaning you know, try and do this as good force as possible with its limitation, of course. So I told you that these initial black holes are likely to be in biased regions, in the regions uh, which um, collapse first and, and uh, therefore have more gas. So in order to do that in a simulation to get this biased region, you need very large volumes. These biased regions are rare. These objects are, in fact, rare in the first place. But within these large volume simulations, you still want to try and understand something about what happened on galaxy scales, understand how the, ga the gas gets into galaxies, eventually into the black holes. So you need the high resolution. And um, eventually, because we are trying to understand gas and how gas gets into, and what gas does as it gets into a galaxy, you need to do this with hydrodynamics as well. So of course, a mixture of all these three things is just in a way kind of thing, okay? something has to give. So if you're trying to do the hydrodynamics in very large or small provolutes of high resolution, you can just do the best you can, but you have to make some approximations somewhere. And so let me show you uh, one example of uh, one simulation where we tried to do this. And of course, uh, you could use different ways of doing this. You can, you know, if you want to look at a biased region, you could do you know, simulations and then pick your bias region and we simulate that particular one region at very high resolution or a few regions. Or you could try more brute force a very large volume and just try to make the large volume as high resolution as you can. So different people have used these approach, uh, approaches pre, um, standardly in cosmology and in the studies of cosmological structure information depending on the particular problem you want to use. And each, uh, of course, each um, each approach has pro and cons. So, of course, when you pick one from the halo, you haven't asked the basic question of, you know, why is this halo special, right? You just pick it and see what happens. You make some assumption of why it should be an interesting halo. In a uniform model, you don't have to do that. You can actually ask yourself, what are, in my case, say, what are the kind of halos that are have the largest gas inflows, are likely to induce the largest growth of black holes? You cannot do that there, but there you can reach higher resolution and study in more detail what happens to these gases as it gets into the central regions and possibly black hole. And there are a few things. 
Anyway, so I'm going to uh, start, by sh start by showing you some results from this meaningful volume. Um, so this is a very, very large simulation that we uh, completed over last year or so. And uh, it was used in using Gadget, which is one cosmological color that's uh, very widely used. And it was sort of uh, hyped up a little bit in order to be able to run such a chunky thing. Um, so it was uh, the volume is uh, 553 megaparsec over H and it had 64 billion particles. And this is sort of unique in the sense that for this volume is the only simulation that contains um, sort of the full physics. Uh, so we, we, we did it with hydrodynamics, with cooling, star formation, feedback, and black holes. Um, and these kind of simulations are the ones that run on national facilities, so the largest computers that you can get hands on. And of course, they um, are a team at work uh, with lots of postdocs and students working both on you know, developing the code to the point that you can run 100,000 cores and to also run it and analyze it and do science with them. So there's lots of students and postdocs involved with that. <clears throat> so just let me uh, give you a peek of what the simulation looks like. So this is just one. Um, Um, one view of what, what this uh, volume E2D looks like. And um, you may, this is done by Gigapan, so this is actually an interactive tool. It's um, something that was developed at, um, in uh, computer science at CMU to do just uh, really remote pictures and be able to actually zoom in and out very quickly and so on. Uh, it's quite fun to go to the website and see the kind of stuff that's on there. But we started using it for cosmology as well, so we, I'm actually running it right now on the internet. So. You can see how boring this volume is when you look at, at the full volume sort of uh, projected into 2D. But once you start zooming in, you start recovering sort of the standard thing that you expect, you know, sort of the clustering and the filaments and the cosmic web that you would expect. This is actually the gas density, but of course it follows very closely uh, the dark matter distribution at the scales. And the simulation is high enough that you can really zoom in and um, we did star formation and, uh, and black holes and so on. And so what you, we were asking ourselves within the context of this question is, for instance, where do the first black holes form? And uh, I think maybe this is one. So in this case, you can ask yourself, sorry, um, you can just ask yourself, uh, go and look in the simulation um, where the kind of regions that in fact have the most, the large, some of the largest black holes growing. This is just, uh, black holes are indicated by this, uh, the green circles and some of the stars are quite purple. So you can find sort of the kind of regions which do induce some of the large uh, growth in black holes. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a second. So what, how did, how, how do black holes grow? As I said, we have seeded these black holes in uniform halos in this very large volume. Um, with an actually quite large mass, which is you know, something of an issue perhaps, but um, it's also related to the resolution of the simulation. And uh, then we follow their uh, growth by uh, sub resolution models. Of course, we don't resolve any interesting physics that has to do with black hole accretion because black hole accretion is very, very far from black hole scales. Sort of at, at fraction six or so, we are more like sub kiloparsec regions. So um, we just uh, assuming that this gas is flowing from basically the innermost resolved region, and uh, we are capping this accretion rate, which depends on the local density and sound speed, to the Eddington rate. And then we are assuming that some fraction of this energy is thermalized, and that's what the feedback. Um, how the feedback operates. So it's extremely simplistic. So at these scales, we're sort of um, assuming that uh, whatever interesting physics has led to, you know, radiation transport, so as it actually thermalized some energy, at the scales that we do resolve in the simulation, and the amount of energy that is thermalized is, of course, um, a parameter because we're stuck with that because we're not actually doing our initial physics in terms of how this feedback is done. So there's a parameter that is introduced by how much energy that is liberated is actually coupled to the gas 
as in form of thermal energy. And this uh, uh, fraction is due to be 5% from other simulations to reproduce the normalization of the up signal energy. So what is the sort of resolution that you reach? In that particular simulation, there's a huge one. It's, um, it's uh, three kilobar set moving, so at this ratio it's a little bit better. <laughs> Yeah, so sub to the bar set, but uh, <coughs> just fine. So um, these are actually from another simulation. So generically, when you've done that, what do you end up with in the context of understanding black hole growth? Um, so each black hole is accreting gas, right, according to the description to show you. So there's an M dot, so an accretion rate. And so each object that you then find in your simulation has a history of its own accretion rate because it depends from to the to, the, to its local density and sound speed and the way the gas is heated, which of course means that it's own black hole mass growing at according to this rate times delta t. So you end up with typically with you know you can look in your simulation everywhere you have a black hole you can reconstruct its uh, light curve as a function of redshift and its ma mass growth as a function of redshift just by, because that was successfully done as the simulation was run. But the last plot you had um, used the lesser of M dot born in M dot adding, and isn't that because, you see, by definition, your M dot is less than M adding, but it's bigger than one. Point. Yeah, sorry, this is, uh, it is, this is another volume, that's one simulation, but we actually used three times at Eddington, so we actually capped it three times at Eddington instead of one Eddington, so oh, yeah. that's what you're seeing here, so yeah. It's actually not. Yeah, so you know you can relax that constraint a little bit and make it a few times everything. That's probably not too crazy, but if you were doing it much bigger than that, maybe you would be bad. Sure, uh, this particular simulation was done three times, but yeah. You did it three times. I three times asked, I didn't. Oh no, but I mean, how many times did you, you do the simulation like what? No, right? sorry, yeah. No, in this particular simulation, it was capped at three times everything. This simulation was only once, yeah, because of but earlier you said that the, that the likes of um, Bagelman would say just use MB of the use, you know, just use MB and you're done, and then you can skip you know, do it if you want. MB, what is MB? Uh, Bondi, so, you know, Bagelman. But, uh, yeah, but, you know, Bondi. typically your Bondi rate is 10 to the 6 times Eddington. But isn't but that when, when it's accreting a lot. When yeah, I call it Eddington, it could be way, way over Eddington. But that's what you want, isn't it? But I'm um, seeing that flux at Q process scale, that flux mass flux. So the fact that I'm assuming that that could be really what gets into the black hole, it's, you know, if I had a, you know, this more scale resolution, um, I could actually, yeah, say, I could conclude, yeah, the accretion of this, you know, way over Eddington, but I can't say that because I'm in such a much, um, at much larger scales. I can only say that it's extremely likely that it would be Eddington at least but it's possible that it would be super Eddington. But it's very unlikely that it would not get to Eddington. And that's kind of the maximum you can conclude from this kind of country. The, you know, can this thing grow at Eddington? Most likely, yes, because there's so much that is flowing in, right? But uh, more than that would require more physics, more, yeah, like he does, but then he's a uh, tiny, tiny skills. Yes? Can you say how many times Eddington you would need to not have a problem building these billion solar mass black holes in the six? Is it 10? Is it 100? Is yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, that's a good question. So I think, yeah, um, it would depend a little bit also where you start from in terms of seed mass, but uh, from what I'm going to be showing you, it, it is sufficient to be an editor to produce this. So anything much above editor is not going to uh, be consistent very yeah. much. You would need to hide it. But that's the luminosity. Sorry? That's yeah. starting to count by. Exactly. So. Okay, so back to this very large volume where we're trying to study. Now I've run this volume, I'm asking myself, you know, where do I get the largest accretion rate onto black holes? And let me search for these objects which have grown the most, right? And this is one particular object which does reach over 10 to the 9 solar mass in the soil by um, Brechtian 6. And this is an accretion history. Uh, the accretion history in the simulation is the, the red curve. So this is the way this is going, and this is what M Eddington would be. So typically what we see, and also in the other light curves we're seeing, but just to focus a little bit more, is that the black hole is a growing indeed uh, steadily at Eddington, 
all the way up to some point, and I've picked these objects to be the most massive at high redshift to redshift 6. So for these objects, it's, it is sustained the accretion rate, and eventually it is quenched. So this accretion rate does decrease. The red line is well below the expected accretion rate. And I'll show you, uh, and as a consequence of that, it's black hole mass saturates in its growth. So it's growing, 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 and editor, and that's the first interesting result. There are objects that can sustain this editor rate without any quantum physics. Okay, there's enough um, accretion rate to do that, but eventually they will also uh, saturate. But your gray line, your gray line is n dot n in the why is it yeah. ever key here? Uh, because I drew it with PowerPoint. <laughs> no, I mean, because uh, it, it, and your is proportional, it's just a mass. So it's the same line, but in the right units. So well, you could do an experiment. Because like, Edinger, Edinger is constant times mass of black hole. You could do waves experiment where you accept that the accretion rate, mass of the be 100 times. Right? Yes. And then presumably you grow, it looks like you supply, it looks like you were supplying way more gas, you yes. were always gas. Yeah. So you could run an experiment that's a more so expensive. Where you yeah. allowed to do a hard time today, and then in principle you can make black holes with immense on masses of richard 10 or 12. That's right. Yeah, yeah. So then you might have to <laughs> hope to see, you know, you, you could, could observation constrain that. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh, so that seems like it has to be a worthwhile thing to try. Right? In other words, is, is there actually enough gas being delivered to the kiloparsec scale? That redshift 12 or 15. Using your prescription. Yeah. Would it actually build a 10 to 9 or 10 to the 10 small mass black hole or a chip? Yeah. Yeah. In, in your model. And then you can say, well, we, you, know, you would see such a thing if it was there. Yes. Yeah. Because you can see the same thing along the way. Yeah. Bear in mind that the luminosity is only the law of the uh, dot. No, no, it's true. Right. But if so you it would be hard to see it in well, terms of. But, still, says that you could see but you still see an object like as bright as this was a solar exactly. direction 12. Yeah, exactly. right. yeah sure. Yeah. And this yeah. one out of mission for you yeah. to kind of the problem as well. Right. And then and then you conclude that this yeah. probably is a very light. But yeah, that would be yeah, interesting sure. to try. You yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. Interesting. I mean you know, this high reaction thing is actually not so impossible to be run, right? Yeah, exactly. There's not much time yeah. there. Yeah. So it's actually where a place where you can play, which yeah. is part of why this is also a bit more. Although, I mean, maybe not in such a even more constrained realization. But yeah, it is. OK, so just to show you where this is happening, this is just a, a little piece of the simulation centered on the black hole, um, this particular object. Um, and it's showing the gas density again coded by temperature. Um, so these three panels on top is during the phase of um, maximum critical growth. Um, you can see that uh, the black hole is sort of sitting there at the center. This blue circle is just an indication of where the real rate is of this object. So the gas is being accreted, but it's also being heated. But the significant heating and eventually ejection of the gas from sort of the real rate from the halo occurs in much um, at the point where we see this quenching in the black hole accretion rate. That's when, in fact, the feedback of the black hole drives this outflow, drives its wind, which it sweeps out and heats the gas from the surrounding of the black hole to the point where the accretion rate is much reduced. But even in that case, you could still see streams of gas, of pre cool gas, these bluish streams that are still able to penetrate. So it's not evacuated things completely. In particular, these large scale streams um, of very high density gas are still able to provide quite a bit of accretion onto this object. So you've got a blue circle and a green circle. Blue is the halo. Yeah, the that's right. It's sort of the blue yeah. yeah. The green is actually the position of the black hole, which uh, is always, there's never a good way to show it. But yeah. yeah are these lines drawn from just one of the other? No, these are just the examples that I'm showing you, just exactly this object. So it's one object. So I'm not already more resting. So this is just another example that, just because of the projection, perhaps illustrates even better how is this gas getting to the black hole, to the center of this galaxy so fast. Um, again, this is gas quote unquote by temperature. And you can see in this projection really the three uh, large. Uh, sort of scale filaments converge into the central objects and how the gas is flowing through the central, all the way into the central regions um, from this very large scale structure all the way to the very center of this object, pretty much uninterrupted. So you see what has been discussed a lot as the core streams 
right, which uh, um, provide a means for dark information, particularly at, um, uh, at relatively deep, at masses we don't tend to the out solar masses in halos. Uh, in this cold stream mode, we don't expect, in fact, it's been shown that the gas will not shock heat at the viral radius and then pull again and get to the center. But these filaments are able to penetrate all the way to the central regions of the galaxies. And uh, the growth of the central black hole, if it's linked indeed to this, as in this kind of calculations to imply, can occur very, very, uh, in very, very efficiently as this gas is really provided at a dynamical time scale. And the energy time scale is in itself very short, so the black hole can be cut very quickly, faster than the you know, observation. Operate. So the gas is plunging through, not knowing about the zero radius of this object, all the way to the center. But at some point, eventually, the feedback of the black hole starts to, in fact, have a couple enough energy to partially disrupt the cold streams, although not entirely, and then keep the gas and operate some function which we see and uh, uh, saturating the growth of the mass, the black hole mass. Okay, so the major point is that by looking through this very large volume and looking at where, it, what, what kind of regions are most conducive for the largest gas inflows to the central of my galaxies, you pick regions where um, typically uh, cold flows um, operating and are actually getting all this gas very, very quickly to the center of these galaxies. So when we look at, for instance, accretion rates as a function of redshift, this is in black, a different simulation, the one that I actually showed you earlier, there. of another black hole that grows much later. This is because um, this simulation actually had to be stopped to some actually because it's too large to grow away. Um, but just very sort of in a sense to compare the typical accretion rate, the peaks of the accretion rates are much higher for these black holes that grow at very early time, although eventually they end up with similar masses than the ones that grow later on, closer to the peak of the um, phase. So these black holes find themselves in extremely gas-dense environments. Of course, we are very high redshift. The, the halos are extremely dense. And, um, and because of this uh, steeper potential that you have in the galaxy, uh, in the early chunk of galactic um, halos, um, the, the feedback is a harder time to couple energy to it. So, High again, density makes the potential much steeper at the center of the galaxies, <coughs> which means that the black hole has a harder time to couple energy, and the black hole can go faster at high redshift compared to low redshift. Then you may ask, are mergers important? Um, this uh, in forever discussion of how phasers are likely to be associated with mergers event. Well, what we see from the simulation and from this very early redshift that certainly a major merger is not necessary. And uh, although, of course, if there is one, um, it would have to be a, a, a and sometimes there is one. This is a black hole mass versus redshift in red, which shows all of the progenitors of this object. And in this case, if there was only one progenitor for this chunk of black hole mass, which was a Kind of comparable mass, and then eventually they, they merge together and form this up another object, which you see also by this jump in the black hole mass. But this is not a common event. Uh, most of the other black holes, when you look at the progenitors, all the objects that have merged, they're, they're mostly minor mergers, so they're really just the sub halos that are coming through in these cold flows and eventually merge into the central object. So uh, major mergers are not. Um, Common, of course, in uh, these very biased halos of this high reaction. Uh, but at the same time, they're certainly not the, the fundamental ingredient, it seems, to get lots of gas into the center of galaxies as this reaction. So let me just uh, uh, do, you know, restate sort of the same thing that I've told you how the gases actually get into the very central region of these galaxies and possibly to the black hole by um, looking at. You know, uh, we have a simulation, you can actually go and ask yourself if this is my end state, say I'm actually five, or you know, I have a black hole in there that is one of these massive ones. Um, this black hole is grown mostly by swallowing gas. And uh, so can I trace back all the gas particles that actually ended up in the black hole? I can, because it's my simulation, right? So that's what the exercise that was done here. So trace back in time all of the gas particles, where were they? Um, before that uh, came to um, the accretion region and were swallowed by the black holes. Well, you can see that as you step back in time, all of these particles did come 
Well, this gas was associated with this large scale filament. This, um, so they all come through uh, directly from um, these cold streams that are providing all the cold gas into the center of this galaxy directly. And when you redo this by plotting the temperature of this, but this is actually a subsample of the particles, just because of the way. And when you do the same by saying, OK, I suppose uh, now uh, let me trace back their temperature as a function of radius. So how do they come into my halo? This is one particular example. So you start, say, at shift 6, and ask yourself, where were these particles before? And what temperature did they have? Then through this diagram, you, you go through this various fractions, various regions, and you see that these particles have entered uh, the narrow radius, which is indicated by this region here of this halo, completely cold, and it stayed cold until they actually get to the regions close to the black hole when they get heated by black hole feedback. But the point is that there's only 5%, which is measured in this PDF here, of gas particles that have entered this halo and eventually encounter the region where we do the accretion of the black hole they were actually shocked into before doing that. 95% of the gas has come cold and flown in directly over to the center at temperatures of 10 to the 4 Kelvin, never heating. So it is gas indeed that associated to this cold screen mode. <coughs> so what's the picture? The gas is from all in and it takes all feet and it takes the black hole and goes in in one step? Mm, yeah. From the whole That's right. From, okay, here you see. Yeah, because that's a resolution. No, no, but I think okay, this is the view of yeah, exactly. the radius. Yeah. So the gas is coming in cold at pretty much at the dynamical time scale, right? So at three cold times. Three cold, it's three falling it's in. Three cold. Cold. And, and it, it actually gets to the street. The time. Yeah, and because, you know, if you, you don't need to wait, like you need to wait to make stars, you need to wait a billion years. The black hole is going to fall in, yes. Or whatever, the sun is time. So yeah, it's extremely efficient. Or would you zoom in? Right, yeah, so yeah, I'm going to get a little bit into that, just a little bit, as much as we can. Okay, so I already made this point, and just leading into this point, so this was a very large scale simulation. You've seen the best we can do with these redshifts is still kilo part, one kilo part, but just lower kilo parts at scale. So is this, just this picture that we discussed, does it, does it stay valid? Is it still there as you really zoom into this, this halos and get a better view of it at higher resolution. So that's what the kind of work that we are attempting to do now. So we are now, now that we know which halos are likely to have the largest gas flows, uh, from, sorry, uh, from uh, the previous simulation, uh, then, um, then, uh, can we re uh, can uh, re simulate these at higher resolution? And um, sorry, there was a movie before, but I'm not even going to show you. Uh, it's kind of something like that. But anyway, can we go to much higher resolution or in a higher resolution enough and resolve the structure of these gas to smaller scales and see if this picture is indeed um, kept? So this is one particular example of what the halo that we did at higher resolution. This was uh, the black hole mass that we saw before. And suddenly we see that in the zoom halo, um, the growth is uh, slightly delayed, but it's certainly consistent. And then there are questions also, what do we, you know, can we go even uh, further down? And it's hard to do that with SPH, uh, unless we do particle splitting or other techniques. But we're trying to also have different techniques in which we do the zooms, such as AMRs, um, in particular, we're using the Ramses code that's work that is done with um, Julien Dubrien and uh, Johan Dubois, basically with Volante uh, CFE, just to try and probe the gas distribution to be very small scales. There are some uh, common features that we know are very different between AMR and SPH. This is exactly the same halo and exactly the same scales, the one that I've been showing to you a little bit. And, uh, but uh, the main point is that to work with SPH because we don't introduce any particle splitting, we get to some resolution that is still not ideal. With the AMR, we can refine this and get to much uh, smaller scales still. Um, and the simulation has advanced, so I can't tell you what happens. As in finish running. Okay, so this is uh, still a very high redshift. We are redshift uh, over 7, 7.5. 
And um, but from what we're seeing is that as much as some of the gas does make it into a disk, but most of it is still flying through the very center um, at three, four times, basically. So as you zoom in, you know, to sort of the smaller scale, so uh, here we're 100 of parsecs, um, the black hole growth is still um, basically unimpeded, and we have not measured things in detail in these simulations, but um, also from previous calculations from these teams, uh, uh, it seems like these cold flows do uh, provide a significant amount of gas, and most of it would be still free for the very center, even though some fraction of it, like 15 percent, settles into a disk. At this redshift, most of it is just, even at these scales, has of parsec scales, is still um, free falling and not. What's the spin rate of these things? Do you select these things to be the things like all the three spin rate? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I never mentioned it. Because, yeah, we just selected it from this route. But that's an interesting So they actually selected from, you know, the, well, the large one. Has a big yeah, I just figure out so which here. ones, you know, that I claim are this growth, you know, let's, let me pick exactly those ones and from my initial conditions and simulate those at higher resolution. So I didn't actually set up a halo that resembled that. I set up exactly that halo. But yeah, it'd be interesting to see what, if I measure this pin, what that, what that is. So for now, this is still holding up, but it, the jury is still up at, as a man completely. Right, we're still at a, uh, maybe this is gonna just quench there and something is gonna happen, we don't know, right? So um, these high resolution runs of course are gonna provide um, some better view of what's happening to the gas with the smaller scales and therefore a better picture of what happens to the black hole at the center of the scales. Are you still limiting them to be a few times a Yeah, for now. But yeah, these are also the ones where we play other games to eventually not doing that at all, eventually doing that resolution where we do have we don't even post bone, we just have like a mass flux, which uh, we measure and we see what that is. And because we are now at sort of two tenths of parsec level, and at least we can learn what, what that is. So, okay, going back a little bit to um, besides just the growth of these objects, so what I showed you to you is that um, cold streams, cold flows are possibly very important for providing all the mass, the strong, large mass inflow rates. Particularly this uh, high redshift set, providing the sufficient uh, accretion rates to and adding to critical accretion rates to grow the first phases. Then what, this, what did this simulation tell us about you know what we know about these first phases? You know, from this first phase of Sloan um, and the follow-up observations um, have uh, looked at other properties of these host galaxies. Do our simulations what do our simulations say? Do they are these quasar growing environments that are not uh, physically relevant uh, compared to observation? So, what we did was also, also try and compare the host's property of this um, very massive objects. So, what we did we select these objects based now on the luminosity, so that we would sit, you know, within the luminosity range that of the slow quasar, and they're roughly the same ones, the ones with the most massive black holes, anyway. And these are uh, star formation rates in the simulations as com uh, compared to what is uh, inferred from observation. This is mostly from CO. Um, and uh, so this is uh, the evolution of the uh, star formation rates as a function of redshift for all of those halos that would in fact make it into a CO sample in terms of the brightness. And we're not doing too bad in terms of you know the typical star formation rates that you expect are approaching a thousand so per year, and that's roughly what we get. And uh, again, uh, you can of course um, compare the um, cold gas fraction that observations again uh, infer from CO observations and what we get in the simulations, and of course if the submission are okay, they should be okay, and they are. So there isn't a major inconsistency for what we can see in terms of reproducing sort of um, the kind of host that um, the very, very basic properties of the hosts as, uh, as constructive observations. Then you can also see, okay, um, what would you see as uh, the uh, black hole signal relationship that you get from these objects? Uh, so we measure black hole masses, we have stars, so we can measure a sigma um, for the stars, we can measure the sigma you know, close enough to uh, what we would call a large a little bit. But, so, and this is what, uh, <coughs> 
uh, sort of diagrams we draw in terms of plotting the black hole masses against snow quasars as a function of redshift, they move up this fast up until the point where at redshift six, they are in the final uh, points there. And these are sort of the data that has been gathered. Um, again, this is something that is inferred, not that some sigma is not measured at this high redshift, but you can infer um, from some proxy what this, this black hole should be, what they should be. So um, from the simulations, what uh, we see is that these black holes are going to black hole mass much, much faster than their sigma. This is not uh, perhaps a surprise given what I described to you, these very fast inflow gas that are um, this large amounts of gas that's well directed by the black hole, and they're um, not going very much sigma, where a lot of this movement in sigma is provided by you know, mergers, major mergers, and so on. So objects shoot, shoot right up. So they have, compared to a local relationship, which is sketched by this dotted line, they have larger black hole masses with respect to their sigma um, than at lower ratios. So these black holes are heavy, heavier than the local counterpart compared to their galaxy, compared to their sigma. And the sort of dotted uh, lines here sort of show what happens to some of these objects later on. And in fact, some of these are moving toward the local signal relationship, subsequent and major merge or so on. But we do instead see um, a growth in the signal. So at first, things get up to the signal rate by growing the black holes faster than their sigma. And so that likely leads to an evolution toward higher reaction where black holes that help grow in this fast mode in this high density environment end up with a, uh, initially with a black hole that is heavier than the large. We're also looking at realization, uh, sorry, um, radiation transport, and yeah, eventually toward the question of realization, the effects of um, black holes of realization. This is just um, uh, an initial um, calculation that depends on a student um, to actually realize just uh, regions around selected black holes. And one interesting thing that has come out is that uh, strong spheres around these bright places can be really much larger than around stellar regions. Um, so these uh, two objects were selected as being the same halo mass, um, roughly, but to one which has one of these um, uh, fast growing black holes, whereas the other one didn't have one fast growing black hole. So the stellar sources here are what dominate uh, the radiation field, whereas here is the black hole. And um, in this case, photons make it much to a much larger area. The strongest here is much bigger, which leads to uh, potentially much more um, anisotropy um, because this bias region will have much uh, faster realization of strong spheres. So that's uh, something that we're working on more um, for understanding. Okay, so I'll just uh, go uh, quickly through this. So I've talked to you about this early growth phase, but of course, uh, not exactly within that very large scale simulation, but other simulations, we want to push things so that we want to check that um, black holes that we produce in the universe today have the right mass structure and mass function and so on. So we have this large volume, we can do statistics. Um, so we can look at the mass function. This is again a very high redshift. So the um, Sloan, uh, as we just observed one quasar, so we can place objects on a luminosity function, which is this point here, and compare to the expect to what we predict from the simulations. Um, again, this is very important. Do we get the right number of quasars? Right? Are we suddenly getting too many black holes going, or way too few? And again, you know, much to also my surprise, we're not too far. So um, it seems that this kind of scenario does lead to the sort of right number density and uh, bit roughly the right luminosity given the constraints. And of course, it's fun to maybe try and um, see whether uh, we can make predictions for things that are coming up in terms of you know, really the, the confirmation of pictures such as this, in which black hole growth is a widespread phenomenon, of course, it's, you know, uh, leads to luminosity functions that are pretty steep. You know, there should be lots of other fainter objects together with very bright ones. And how many there are, and a uh, different redshift is something that is going to be drawn. Um, upcoming and current surveys. So that's going to be a, a very fundamental test, going away from just measuring mm -hmm. things down here, but uh, standing through the large dynamic range of the luminosity function. And a much stronger test for our models. Of course, we can look at the clustering, as we have these large volumes. 
And um, so this is uh, the correlation length, the typical scale of clustering of phasers. And again, there's uh, the best measurements that we have are again from the large surveys such as Sloan, and which are the points in this diagram. This is the evolution of the correlation length of the red shift. Uh, in the data, this is a simulation. And this is uh, trying to match the sample. So again, it doesn't look like we're getting the wrong halos completely to have uh, so not, not major inconsistency, which is sort of uh, um, just give some faith to these models at uh, some level, at least that we're not going to look very wrong from what we understand, also from the statistical point of view of these black hole populations. Um, there's something um, interesting, and maybe I'll finish at that as well, that as now we don't just look at the singular object, but the whole population, there, is a, there appears to be a special mass scale, a special scale at which black hole grow the most. So if you look at the Eddington ratio, so basically a ratio of the velocity to Eddington, or basically how much mass, when is most of the black hole mass accreted, when is the most of the growth of black hole occurring, and we plot that as a function of black hole mass, you see that this function is very peaked. So if you ask yourself, when do most of the black holes grow? They grow, of course, at the peak, and when they're roughly approaching 10 to the 8 solar masses. So these are, from our simulations, the black holes that are growing the most. And uh, as we plot what mass scales is going to respond to the whole scalar mass, this is roughly 10 to the 12. So, uh, sorry, I'll get into that. Uh, so this is really the scale um, below which um, cold flow seems uh, appear to be the dominant mode for galaxy formation, and perhaps those that lead uh, to the peak. And the reason that we quench, of course, the growth about this is due to the fact of feedback that also seems to be because these functions are so peaked. Um, seems to indicate that feedback only starts to become important when this cold flow mode is in itself being quenched and um, not effective anymore. But uh, we're entering the shock heated phase of the growth of this halo. So as this gas is taking longer to come into the halo and first the shock heat and then cools, it's much easier for feedback to operate and eventually um, quench this black hole growth. Also another thing that comes out when we look at these curves, um, they were rescaled by one plus huge, which is kind of interesting. So it seems like um, you know, the, so it's an internal accretion rate, the additional fraction over one plus cubed. So this curve is really just scales as density, uh, the cosmological density. So there are, uh, the higher the red shift, the more the black holes are growing. And again, this is sort of supported also by recent observations or hints from observations, where this lambda is actually the same quantity, is the same, so it's an additional fraction in log plotted this redshift, and there's this one plus a cube dependence that is traced by the data, and this is what we trace from the simulation. So we have this similar dependence of the evolution of the editor and the rate of redshift. And the fact that it's related to density, sorry, I'll just that, is also kind of interesting. Um, so if we, instead of plotting this quantity, I just plotted the density, uh, around the black hole, I would get this black point. So you can see sort of the shape of this curve is really regulated by what is the density um, at sort of the innermost region of this halo. So this is, of course, related to this one plus this cube square as well. So um, when I ask myself, how do the holes, you know, if I want to quantify how do these black holes grow, they just grow because they have a lot more gas, a lot more gas density, a higher redshift. And that's why you can get more effective growth. And, um, and this gas density is related to um, just the last scale environments that they are providing in the hospital. So maybe I've run out of time. Yeah, so um, let me just uh, skip to the conclusion. Um, sorry about that. So uh, what I, I tried to tell you a little bit about is how we can um, sort of uh, trying to understand black hole growth within large scale um, uh, structure formation simulation. Um, and the way we can do that is by introducing some resolution volume that tells us about how you know, the black hole swallows gas and the feedback that it can do 
um, we have told you a little bit of how, within this context, um, it seems that the first phases, uh, growth by large scale inflows, uh, mostly regulated by the scope flow mode of that information. And that's what constitutes uh, the majority of the black hole growth and AGM triggering these very high redshifts at least. Um, these very um, fast uh, gas inflows that make, um, that get the gas to the center at um, the free pole time scale. And the AGM feedback is operates, but only operates um, as this uh, halos enter this shock into the regime. And eventually it's of course the AGM feedback that sets them into the M sigma relationship, but the M sigma relationship expected is um, offset from the local one because it's more early on that course we go first with respect to the underlying galaxy. And I'll stop at that. Gas, 
either a collapse or you're trying to look at the first hour as two very different problems. And you come up with two different mass ranges. And uh, this could follow up with this question because how do you populate the usual? Yeah, I just uh, seed anything that I start resolving. With with a level of uh, tensile five. So I'm in the upper end because actually anything that I start to resolve is already. And the first table is around that you resolve it. Uh, yeah, of course you tend to deny that the problem, right? That's why the early goal is basically um, impossible if you're doing that. Yeah. But for instance, in the zoom run, I can apply right now and change this. I mean, I think even in that, I already put it to the screen. I mean, the ones that were short, I'm losing it. What physics that you're putting in, you mentioned like Cooling's formation of feedback. What is most um, uncertain and how sensitive the radio is? <laughs> That's a very good question. I mean, well, there's a lot to this question. Um, I guess uh, the most uncertain things are related to the subgrid physics, so that's related to star formation and uh, and black hole um, growth. So in order to do star formation, you have to do a sub-resolution model from your ISM, and therefore, so typically these models are based on a density threshold upon which you do star formation, and then what kind of feedback? You have supernovae, but how do you take this feedback? You just pressurize the gas. And you do some Fancy than that. Do you this use huh? Do you use yeah, so I don't know if you're familiar with these models, but this is a basic model uh, which is very simplistic for the star formation side. And for the black hole, it's again some grid physics, which is uncertain to the point where you know, you're know you just doing something so simplistic that you're bypassing a lot of uh, the physics there. So, yeah, more work on that on uh, the star formation and particularly the feedback associated with it. There's some interesting work by um, uh, Phil Hopkins, Ali Coulter, and uh, others actually also in Iran that sort of have actually shown how, <laughs> which is perhaps something interesting, that you know, how your star formation model actually is kind of irrelevant once you have feedback. <laughs> so things always so that's something perhaps that, you know, this is very initial sort of investigations, right, where they're showing that it's really what goes into the feedback that is much more relevant, rather than what exactly you choose and your condition for star formation. So that's perhaps where I feel is our biggest level is how to do this bloody feedback. <laughs> well, both from star, form, star formation and, uh, and black holes. The power is in there. I'm not worried about the creation, to be honest. I'm worried about the feedback part. 